Um, in my capacity as uh, Chair of the Faculty of Law, I'm delighted to welcome you to what would be a fascinating and intellectually stimulating afternoon. We have an excellent program today, but I'll explain that the event is uh, simultaneously backward-looking and forward-oriented. Uh, the look backwards arises from the centenary that prompted the faculty to organize this event. As most of you are aware, 2019 is the centenary of the enactment of the Sex Disqualification Removal Act 1919, when women were finally allowed to practice law. Uh, this, we thought, was an occasion worth marking with an event oriented around Cambridge women in law. Uh, many of you um, are also likely aware that the centenary today we're marking has received considerable attention. At the forefront in this regard is the First Hundred Years Project, a groundbreaking um, uh, history project that the Law Society, the Bar Council, uh, and the Chartered Institute for Legal Executives has supported. You likely uh, already have seen the first 100 years banners um, that are on display as you enter the law faculty building. If not, then please take a look uh, at one of the two breaks this afternoon or uh, with the reception. Um, at the same time, please keep an eye out uh, for the display of Equal to Everything, um, Judge Brenda and the Supreme Court, which is a children's book authored by Afua Hirsch and published by the Legal Action Group. Essa Pilger, uh, publishing director for LAG, is here to answer your questions and has copies of the book available for purchase. Um, uh, Spark 21, a charity set up to inform and inspire future generations of women in the legal profession, has been the primary institutional driver of the first 100 years project. Dana Dennis Smith is the project's creator, uh, and we are delighted she is with us today to provide more background. I'll ask Dana to step forward uh, to speak to us in just a moment. Um, but what I want to say first is that today's event is also firmly tied to the future. Um, I'll pick up at this point now and return to it in my concluding comments uh, when, the con when the event draws to a close. Briefly, today's event is not a standalone occasion. Instead, it marks the launch of Cambridge Women in Law, which will provide the focal point for interchange between those interested in women's involvement in the study and practice of law from a particularly Cambridge perspective. Though I'll return to, uh, as I said, I'll return to this theme, um, but one thing I want to do is if you are interested in embarking on what this should be a very exciting journey, please do sign up. Um, you can do so electronically through the website, which is here. Um, or also, I believe we're also doing it old school and you can actually physically sign up this afternoon. With that, I'd like to turn things over to Dan and Smith and then I'll just speak for a couple of minutes before we start just to give you a quick roadmap of how this afternoon is going to go. Thank you. Uh, good to see you, everybody. Um, I'm Dana Dennis Smith. I founded the first 100 Years Project five years ago. In fact, the idea came to me about six years ago, um, having come across a photograph with just one woman in the middle out of about 60 partners in one of the city law firms. Um, I felt that we couldn't really shape the future of the profession. I'm a lawyer myself without really understanding where we came from. To my surprise, many people I met did not know that the centenary was coming up and they were really not preparing for it. So I set on this path of unearthing the story of women long forgot forgotten, many actually graduates of this very university, and also collecting the stories of our generational pioneers, uh, a couple of them you will see today um, at the closing uh, session. So I'm really, really delighted that we were able to deliver the biggest campaign in relation to women in law that has been publicly, um, privately funded, I should say, and it's been uh, run by exclusively by volunteers. So what have we achieved apart from the exhibition which has been touring the country and it's had over a million visits in 12 months, we also have a book coming out uh, later next month, but also one of the proudest moments probably will come when we will unveil the first artwork um, that will depict a woman in law in the Supreme Court in the city of London. Why are we doing this? Really, very simple. I think this campaign has been our generation's gift to the future generations, including my child, who's eight years old. I want her to consider a future, a future in law and a future going as far as she wants. But I think it's really important to leave a legacy. And I think an organization like this and this kind of uh, institution is probably best, best uh, place to know what a legacy is and what a difference it makes. For me, I think it's really important that women coming into the legal profession understand they belong to um, a whole history of um, legal um, 
contributions and uh, that we are able to really pass that on to the next generation. So they feel they are part of a tradition, a tradition of women in law, but to the rule of law overall. And really, you know, celebrate them, but also make sure that the future is shaped along this contribution as well, and they're not forgotten in the future. So the whole archive that we put together over the last five years, which has 76 biographies that are original documentaries of the lives of pioneers in our day, it's all being donated to the London School of Economics Women's Library for future generations to have the research at hand around these pioneering women that we have today, um, apart from the book and the artwork. So we want to create a legacy that is visual, is accessible, and really puts women at the center of the legal profession because that is really the quietest revolution that we have seen in the last 100 years. It's the arrival of women and really the dominance of them as we enter the next 100 years. I think it needs to be celebrated but also it will shape us to drive the right um, agenda in the future. So please do follow our project because there's so much still to come. So many more films to be put out and premiered uh, in the next coming months. And obviously keep an eye out for our, if you like, we called it Gift Her the Future campaign around um, the artwork. Um, nothing has been done like this before and I think you will really be proud of what we've achieved. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you, Dana. That was a fascinating overview of a great project, and we're delighted it was the catalyst for today's event. Um, all, as I indicated what I want to do, I'm going to bring things back to the present now, having been a look to the past. Um, and what we have, as I've indicated, is an absolutely first-rate program, and I'm going to provide a brief overview. Um, our first uh, session is entitled Women in Practice. Our speakers here are each Cambridge Law graduates who have flourished in different practice realms. Barristers and solicitors are both well represented, and my colleague Pippa Rogerson will moderate this discussion. Our second session focuses on women in the wider world. Again, our speakers are each Cambridge Law graduates. A number began their careers in practice. Each, however, has struck out in a different direction now. Those different directions vary far and wide, extending from the NGO sector to criminal prosecutions to the investment banking world, the media, and politics. Catherine Barnard will introduce this panel and Nikki Padfield will act as the moderator. Our third session features uh, two of the Cambridge Law graduates currently serving on the UK Supreme Court, Baroness Hale and Lady Arden. The title of this session is In Discussion. Um, we were well aware when extending our invitations to both Baroness Hale and Lady Arden, they have plenty on their plates, as evidenced by early this week. Um, so what we decided to do, rather than ask them to engage in a set piece lecture to get that sort of preparation, what we did is we thought that what we would do is give, uh, have them discuss their respective careers and canvas in general terms, challenges women in the law have faced, currently face, and are likely to face in the future. Uh, Sarah Worthington will formally uh, introduce our speakers and Eilish Foran will moderate what will no doubt be a fascinating session. We have plenty of ground to cover. Let's begin. So, Pepper Rogerson, please come up and introduce and work with uh, our first panel. Well, thank you and welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to see you all uh, here for this really interesting afternoon. Now, I need my panel, please, to come and um, sit. As we will see, we have six absolutely remarkable and interesting women. Oh, Amanda. Um, and I am going to have to be a ringmaster, I think. I'm going to have to do my best to be properly assertive, or as we know, other people might describe it, uh, either bossy or formidable. Um, <laughs> but, but I think assertive is about right. So coming from... Your left to right, my right. Uh, we start with uh, Keelan Gallagher, who is a silk at Data Street. She's worked tirelessly in women's rights, for example, against the effects of austerity and welfare cuts. Next to her is Shona Gillett, who is also a barrister in England and Ireland. We've got a bit of an Irish connection down here, and is now a part-time judge and tribunal member. Then we have Jessica Gladstone, who's a partner at my old firm, Pick a Chance. Uh, and she does international commercial and investment arbitration and is also a former legal advisor at the FTO, so has worked in the other direction from outside in, maybe. Next to her is Priya Lenny, 
who is from Herbert Smith Freehills and has an absolutely fascinating role, and I think one we're going to want to hear more of, um, in legal operations, in the disruption, really, to the practice of law and how women might uh, participate in that. She co-founded She Breaks the Law, which is an interesting name, I think, for a global network of women leaders of legal innovation. Then we have Sarah Luna, who is a partner in Slaughter and May, ahead of the cash practice, I believe, and has survived a couple of supervisions with me, so <laughs> <laughs> And amongst many other things, she's set up the Slaughter and May's Female Leadership Development Network. Then we have Elaine Penrose of Hogan Lovell. She's a partner in the Financial Services and Regulatory Disputes team. But very involved, I know her more as a, as a football player and a very keen follower of football and has done some <laughs> charity work with the British Paralympic Association. And last, but certainly not least, uh, is Amanda Pinto, who is a um, Silk at First Three Chancellor Lane Chambers and Vice Chair of the Bar Council. She's been a champion of the First 100 Years Project. So we've got Cambridge in common, we've got law in common, we're women, and there are lots of other connections. As I'm sure you're finding in the room, I had wonderful conversations with people who, who knew each other from before. So I have got an hour with these wonderful, wonderful women. Um, and I will try and allow enough time for questions, enough time for everybody to participate, but I am well aware that I um, uh, have to keep a tight rein. So apologies if sometimes I have to cut people off. question I thought might be interesting is a certain sort of backward looking question but it may be a context setting question for where we are and what I wanted to ask really is reflecting on a career either at the bar or as a solicitor you know how is the legal profession different the practice of law different for women today than when we started if I look back to my um, time at Clifford Charles and my time starting as an academic some things have really changed. Maternity rights, for example, paternity leave, uh, flexible working, those are really, really very different to when I started and we were somehow expected to bury any um, hindrance like, like having children. But that's maybe just my perspective. So I wondered if I could start with Amanda, who has been a barrister, I think, straight through. That's right. <laughs> Very unadventurous, although I did nearly leave, actually, at one point, <laughs> because I didn't think my career was progressing in the way I wanted it to. But I didn't leave, and I'm very happy I didn't. So how do you think um, the profession is different today? Well, I think there's two things, and, and one of them is actually not really to do with gender. Uh, one is tech. I think tech's really changed a lot of things, uh, the way people work, um, and access to materials, all those sorts of things. Um, I think ways of working have changed, and so that's meant different ways of being able to do law. And secondly, I think, generally speaking as well, the profession is much more open to different sorts of people. Uh, as far as women are concerned, uh, it, it, is, it is just a completely different environment at the bar. When, when I joined, I was the first woman in my chambers. I was asked repeatedly in pupillage interviews whether I was going to have a family and was I going to leave. You definitely wouldn't be able to say that now. Um, now, there are about 50% of pupils are women, and um, that's not to say that our career progression is smooth and sustained, I'm afraid. We do have a problem in the um, bar with retention of women, but there is at least a cohort coming in at the bottom, so that's one good thing. Um, secondly, I think we've got many more examples of fantastic women to look up to and to see that you can get to the top of your profession or to positions of seniority that simply weren't there when I started. And thirdly, as you say, there are just systems and policies in place. Um, it is in fact the case that we do have a problem with retention of women. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Minnie. Um, uh, thirdly, I think um, there are systems which are being uh, enforced that simply were either not there or were not enforced, such, such as you say, as, as maternity benefit and um, well-being, which absolutely was just not part of the equation at all. In fact, I think when I joined, the real well-being issue was whether there was a woman's loo. You know, <laughs> <laughs> not to knock um, 
the, the facilities being available uh, to all of us. Uh, when I was first at, as it were, Power Chance, I think the laboratories were marked men, women, and parts. <laughs> <laughs> But they did actually have a woman partner well before many other things, I have to say. But she just didn't count as a partner to me. <laughs> um, Sarah, you've been a long time at Slaughter and May. Yes, we also actually, when I, start, when I was first made a partner, the loo outside the partner's dining room was the men's loo, and the women had to go to a different floor to go to the loo. So uh, it's a common, no longer the case. I think the biggest change for me is the fact there are just more women around. And I think that... Uh, that means people, women feel more as if they belong. Uh, when I was made a partner, I think there was an element of playing, playing at being a man, actually. You know, you, we, we still have, sort of May still has a partner's dining room. We have lunch together every day. And when I first used to go to lunch, she used to talk about football and cars, really. Um, <laughs> and I sit there now and, you know, I get young female partners talk about, you know, some problem they had dropping their kids off at school that morning or something they had on with their... You know. But just, they, they bring themselves to work, and I think that that's something that I'm not proud of. I don't think we did, in my generation, bring ourselves to work. We, we, we played at, 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 um, at, at being like a man. And I think another change is that the clients, there's more clients now who are women. So many women leave private practice, but the reason they leave private practice is they go in-house. And therefore, our clients are women. And therefore, although you have to try and persuade my male partners of this, actually, clients don't necessarily want to spend all day Saturday at the cricket anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good news for us, too, because we don't have to spend all day Saturday at the cricket. So a lot of the focus on how you interact with your clients has changed and, and become more feminine. And I think that has made it an easier place to be a lawyer because, obviously, part of uh, a big part of private practice is the business development side of it, and it's 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 just a more healthy environment if your BD is in a is in a mixed environment too. Does anybody else on the panel have something they'd like to say, Keila? Sure. So um, I, I entirely agree with what's been said about how much better it is than before. But I suppose my short answer to how is a career in the legal profession different than when you start up for women uh, is not as different as it should be. Mm. And uh, if you take the bar, for example, we've had three decades since the early 1990s of equal entry level for women. Mm -hmm. um, so you now have 50% of pupil barristers being women. But then as you go further and further up in the higher echelons, the numbers are disappointingly low and stubbornly low. And the same is true, obviously, in the solicitor's profession. You've got 60% of entrants being women since 1990. But then when you go to partner level, it's only 27%. When you go to magic circle firms, it's even lower. And I did have a stat, which I thought might be um, interesting. I, I see many of you in the room, um, and indeed on this panel, uh, who are women QCs. And uh, you will know how few of us there are, despite the headlines about increased diversity. I'm sure you got this letter as well. And when I took Silk, I got a letter from a lady called Eleanor Platt QC at One Garden Court. And every year, she writes to every single woman who takes Silk, and it starts, dear female QC, and then it attaches to her email, to her letter, a list of all female silks ever. And when I took silk in 2017, uh, I was number 397. And that included all women, alive or dead, who had ever been silk. And that's quite a shocking and sobering piece of reading, I think. I mean, my colleague, Helena Kennedy, silk in 1991, was only number 44 ever. So I got this, saw I was number 397 at the end of the list uh, in 2017 because of my age, uh, and it was completely dwarfed by the number of male silks in practice at that time, which was about 1,600. So I think things have changed, but my core point would be not changed enough. And if we haven't managed to move the dial in relation to women, uh, despite three decades of equality at entry level, I've got real concerns about how we move the dial on other issues like social mobility, race, and diversity in other fields. No, I think that's a, a really important point. And, and in fact, my generation of entry to the law society, when I got whatever it is, admitted to the role of a solicitor um, in 1984, we were the first generation of 50-50. So it's a little ahead of the bar, actually. And boy, has that seemed to have stopped. Indeed, it's even the, the, the numbers have even gone backwards. So the leaky pipeline is, I think, is, I think an issue that you're very right to highlight. And I utterly agree with you that unless we've got enough diversity in the room, other sorts of diversities don't get any sort of lifting. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to add? Yes. 
I was just going to say that one of the things that um, I hope will help move the dial significantly now, even though it, progress has been slow, um, m might be the changes in policy over um, shared parental leave. Mm. Um, by making it so visibly a joint sort of gender-free issue uh, to, to be a child carer um, and to make that an equal burden, in a sense, and the opportunity for it to be an equal burden, because it is an opportunity as well. I think that could do more for the future of equality than, um, than a lot of other policies and changes that might have had less impact. I mean, already, we've not had it in place very long, clip a chance, but already the take-up has been phenomenal, and much more than some of the senior male partners had anticipated, because it was so far from something that would have been on their agenda in, in past years to interrupt your career like that. If actually people are jointly interrupting their career, it becomes less of a, a female issue and, a, and a, then a permanent female issue to be the primary, um, the one with primary responsibility to um, juggle that work-family balance. The only thing I might add um, to, to the, the career question um, is slightly different perspective and on a more positive note. And I think personally, it's a very exciting time to be um, part of our legal profession at the moment. Uh, and not just for men, but uh, sorry, women, but for men as well, in the sense of um, the legal profession being disrupted and the, the pace of change, particularly in the last uh, couple of decades, has been so much and it's only going to grow exponentially. Uh, and frankly, even when I started the, the profession a couple of decades ago now, um, some of the, the career options or um, the sort of alternative routes into the profession simply didn't exist, uh, whether it be due to advancement of technology or, or the sort of new and different ways of working. I mean, you could, as a young um, legal professional or in, in the legal profession, you could be a legal technologist, you could be a legal engineer, you could be a process designer, a, a you know, data scientist, a project manager, all of these new career options that simply didn't exist. And that's possibly true for both genders. Mm. And I know that we wouldn't all answer the first question. So, um, <laughs> We've got, we're doing well. We've got time. <laughs> first, just to echo the point about parental leave, but also talk about paternity leave. So ironically, it's campaigning for men's rights to care for children that empowers women. Watching friends where, they, where the man would have taken more time off but can't because he's banned from doing so by his contract and watching your friend take more time off that she didn't want to, to turn. It's about us being allies for men in that way as well. Mm -hmm. So if you're in an organization, you don't know what the paternity leave is for the men in your organization, then look at that and campaign because often the men don't want to ask for that as well because mm -hmm. of their own gender biases about being seen as weaker if they actually want to do more childcare. Mm -hmm. If I, if I could just add one thing, just mm -hmm. looking backwards, because this is a, a wonderful conversation that we're having when you think that when I joined the bar, there was no such thing as a maternity policy at all, let alone a paternity policy, let alone parental leave. It just, it just didn't exist. And in fact, the people in my chambers who had asked whether or not I would have a family and I said, well, I don't know, but it, I might, um, what, what they uh, also definitely thought was that not only... Um, would I not come back to work after having a baby? They thought I should not come back to work after yeah. having a baby. So really to be having this discussion, I think shows that things have moved on, even though I, of course I agree that there's a, a long way to go. Um, yes, if I just have my two pence worth as well. There was a very interesting uh, piece of research done by Murray Edwards recently about the importance of making allies with men and with other groups who are trying to find this sort of balance um, in the responsibilities and that we don't necessarily just focus on children as a problem. Uh, there are wider caring responsibilities and, and indeed other things that some of us might want to do than work, um, which can be also captured in part of this, uh, part of this discussion. Mm. And I think, that, you know, the, the, the flexible working piece is really relevant here because what we've seen at my firm, Hogan Lovells, is that the men are taking up the opportunity to take flexible working options, and not just because they have children. I have an associate in my team that doesn't have kids and wants to work and does work four days a week because his wife is a doctor, works difficult hours, and, and lives out in Margate. And so um, I think it's a brilliant sort of role model for future lawyers and men coming through that flexible working isn't a women issue and it isn't a problem issue. It's just something that work has to accommodate. Mm. Mm. So I think 
Is there anybody in the audience who'd like to add anything? Yes, Joe. Thank you. Yes. I like to read and think and I'm always sure that I can do this and I can do it and I can do that. But I've got a train Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Should we should we move on? I think these these discussions are going to sort of we have um, a few cross currents um, because I know I want to get down to some sort of specifics and maybe some some positive things. Which is, I think we've all come across bumps in the road in our careers of various sorts. Um, uh, they may be internal or external, there are all sorts of bumps in the road. And I just thought I might ask my panel, you know, have they had a major hurdle that they've met in progression through um, the career that's, that's sort of halted their progression or um, affected their progression? And how did, how did you overcome it? So I wondered if I could start with Elaine, really, whether <laughs> has your career been smooth? Some people do have smooth careers, I believe. <laughs> Um, not me. Um, well, okay, yes, so the bump gone. in my career is that my husband died 12 years ago, and I have five children. Um, but, you know, that's, that, that's one of those things that happens. Life tends to throw shit at you from time. So, Elaine, have you been lucky, or...? Well, in many ways I have. I'm, I'm certainly less interesting than all my panellists, in the sense that I've been at my firm for my entire career. So I joined as a trainee in 2000, and I'm a partner 19 years on. So in that sense, it's been very smooth, you know, it would seem so at least. Um, the one bump that sort of, I think, affected me throughout my career, probably until after I became partner, was this, I think, what you said, Sarah, about um, having to play like a man. Um, I would get feedback as a junior associate, a, a five foot two junior associate, who looked young for my age at the time anyway, um, that I needed to display more gravitas. Um, <laughs> that I needed to police my enthusiasm. And I always found that incredibly irritating because I had my fellow trainees and junior associates, male ones, who were six foot tall, deep voiced, and, you know, if they looked a bit young, they might grow a beard. And they were done, you know, they, they had gravitas. And I think the whole idea of gravitas was a, is a male construct of what, mm. it, what it means to have gravitas. And it really annoyed me because I, I felt that what I needed to do to develop gravitas was to lower my voice, wear heels. I mean, obviously, I couldn't do much else than wear heels. I couldn't sort of stretch myself. Um, and, and I just hoped that doing a good job and delivering good service to clients would, would do the trick. Since making partner, I, I wouldn't say I've rebelled against that, but I, I think it's so important that you can be yourself um, and that actually having a diverse range of approaches in delivering advice is actually a good thing. And so now, you know, I absolutely refuse to comply with that idea of policing my enthusiasm. I think it's a good thing to be enthusiastic. You know, I, I rock up at work on my micro scooter. Uh, people look at me sideways. I say, do you like my wheels? And we just move on. And, 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 and I like the fact that junior associates coming through can look at, look at the partners and say, actually, you can be yourselves and you don't have to be a certain way in order to be able to succeed. Um, so I guess I sort of overcame it in the wrong way, but I, I hopefully now 
but but that's, you know I think that's so interesting, is it? We've all had this, and I think Sarah put it so well. You know, are you turning up as yourself at work, or are you having to mask yourself? Or so? and that is something, an issue that is much wider than just women. Actually, mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a it's a point about anybody who doesn't come from the in crowd. Um, have we described uh, the in crowd? You know, it can be the working class guy from from Bolton, frankly, mm -hmm. as as well as it, it can be somebody. Um, who wears something different, wants to pray at a different time, wants to go Absolutely. to bed with somebody different or whatever they happen to be. Um, and that sense that we have to conform to is really, it is a sort of straitjacket, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, and it, it, it's, it's, it's good to hear that, but maybe you have to get to a certain level mm. before you're permitted to somehow acquire the gravitas <laughs> of, the, uh, of the office. Um, Priya, have you, you've had a, a slightly less straight up career than maybe might imagine but have you come across any hurdles that have that you've you've had to overcome well i well not not any um, more or less as, as as most of us i suppose but um it's it i was just reflecting on this question on the train this morning actually and i thought can i pick one more, more than that it's it's a question of um have i come across hurdles and how have i tackled them generally and i guess um it, it's about sort of the, the ones that i have managed to come across anyway or rather uh, turn them around successfully is when I've had the kind of mindset to look at it as a challenge and I, I love solving problems. So when I've come across hurdles in my career, I've always looked at them as a new challenge, a problem to solve um, and sort of turned it around its head to try and look at it as an opportunity to, to disrupt myself and to disrupt what I do and to make the most of the situation and, and where I am. So I suppose I've always looked at my hurdles more as challenges, um, but I do have an interesting um, sort of perspective on what um, you said, Sarah, and very, very sort of feeling um, the same way, particularly when I started as a young uh, solicitor in the city um, in, in being me, you know, I look different, I sound different, um, I am from a different culture and, you know, often would find myself obviously in a room majority full of men, but also who look and sound and the same and who make the same jokes that make sense to themselves. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, not, not knowing much of Monty Python well, wasn't even part of that. Um, but, but, you know, trying to fit into a culture that I was never going to fit in and, and being an outsider. Um, and especially, as I said, as a young lawyer, I found it sometimes hard at the beginning to find my voice in that room full of men with that deep voice. Um, how do I make myself heard? I do have an interesting point to say, but it was about trying to find my inner voice and my confidence and actually to look at myself as a unique person. So everything that made me different was actually my asset. So I turned them around to my advantage to think, actually, the fact that I'm different for you from you means that I've got something different to add to this dialogue. And the minute it turned around in my head to think that actually my difference is my USP, it, it absolutely flipped my confidence and it flipped the way I conducted myself at those meetings or made those points. They didn't often land the way I wanted them to, mind you. Not everybody liked my different perspectives, but majority of the times they did. And when they didn't, at least they appreciated the fact that I had a different perspective, that I had the courage to ask the difficult questions and often the stupid questions that others didn't want to ask. It doesn't mean that they didn't have those questions, just they didn't want to ask those. Whereas as an outsider, as somebody who never fitted in, I felt quite comfortable asking those questions and, and breaking down those assumptions and actually making a very different perspective. So over the years, I actually embraced being different and turned that into my USP. Well, I think that's wonderful advice and the never assume anything is always good advice. I think. And there's no such thing as a stupid question, actually. It usually is the question that everybody else <laughs> has, but nobody wants to ask. I'm quite sure how this CDC works. Um, does anybody else from the panel have some something to share on that? Well, I, I said I nearly left the bar. Yes, and, do. Um, uh, and I'd actually forgotten it. it. It happened such a long time ago. I was, I'd had my first child, and... Um, my career had basically completely plummeted. I, my clerks didn't think I should be there. Uh, they didn't give me any good work. I was finding it quite hard with a very young baby. And um, I thought, you know what? What I really want to do is run a Tate gallery. I better leave. So um, <laughs> I thought, well, rather than just leave, because I'd always loved being a barrister, but rather than just leave, I better check that actually doing history of art was a good thing to do. So. I did uh, the beginning of a degree at Birkbeck in the evenings, and um, 
I really was thinking that I'd leave. And then in the course of that year, um, my practice improved. I actually had another baby and I stayed. But I think it was because of exactly that thing of work allocation, uh, everybody else's assumptions that I wasn't going to stay, that I wasn't going to be uh, a, a good barrister that would benefit Chambers. And um, I mean, frankly, in a way, the course of my career has shown that they, they were wrong. And uh, so I think actually acting on what you think you want to do and, and taking a, a dynamic step was an important thing for me, actually. And then, thank goodness, I hadn't just left and, you know, gone on a different career path. But it, 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 does, it does show that sometimes actually believing that you have got other options is, is, a, is, a, is a positive. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. I mean, I, I always used to joke that I've always, you know, I, I'd always be ready to leave at any time. I mean, you know, I, I see some of my partners take out these massive mortgages and I think they commit themselves to being there for like another however many. I think, why would you ever do that? Because you can't just walk out in a fit of peak when you want to. <laughs> and actually knowing that you can walk out in a fit of peak gives you so much, mm. so much confidence and freedom. And actually, if you don't have that, I think it's very hard. So I, I would have something about it's just, options. It's just an observation. I'm just looking at all the solicitors and so impressed at how kind of calm and polished and poised they are and the barristers are like <laughs> thinking on their feet, scribbling notes. <laughs> and then I said, but Amanda's a QC and she's not doing that. And then I saw the inside of her hand had notes written on it. busted. That's Could I say a quick thing on, yes, on that question? Cool. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was an Irish thing. We were the two with the <laughs> scrappy pages. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's just, I was really struck by what Amanda said there um, about almost leaving the bar because I, I had one of those moments too. And I, I like to think of it as being, rather than a glass ceiling issue, a sticky floor issue, if I can put it that way. <laughs> and it was after I'd had my second baby. I have three children, three small children. And when you look at the stats for retention of women at the bar, it's the second child in which a huge number of women just drop off the edge of a cliff. And there's particular issues at the bar because you're self-employed, you don't have a human resources department. You know, if you're someone, just to get quite personal, who has had multiple miscarriages, which mm. I went through, you've got to keep it to yourself. If you reveal that to, or you believe you've got to keep it to yourself, if you reveal it to other people, um, they may think you're flaky, you're unavailable for work. So there are a whole series of things which um, it did actually relate to gender, which caused me some difficulties. And I've got to say, I was someone who for a very long time was one of those people who said, I'm not a feminist. You know, I really did use that. And there's, um, I read a few years ago um, a quote from Mamo MacDonald, who used to run the uh, Irish Countrywomen's Association. And she said, she's a mother of 11. And she said, I didn't start out as a feminist. It was life that made a feminist out of me. And I think I had a bit of that because uh, when I first was pregnant with my first child, I experienced for the first time soft sexism, if I can put it that way. And I'd always been one of those people who said, you know, it's all about equality of opportunity, not equality of result. I had very fixed views about it. And then suddenly, it's like a punch in the stomach when it happens to you. And the way it happened to me uh, when I was pregnant the first time um, was I was very open about it right from the outset. Um, I was doing some quite high-profile big cases. And one day, a very well-meaning uh, male silk in my chambers said to me, oh, I had a call from one of your solicitors earlier who's going to instruct you in this big case. And I said, she's actually pregnant and she's very tired. And it had gone somewhere else. And, you know, what do you do with that in a self-employed profession? You know, ring to get the now non-existent brief, which has gone somewhere else. You know, there's particular difficulties with that and assumptions. So, um, and I, I, I did kind of drink the Kool-Aid about never being able to say uh, that you had a childcare issue, for example. Um, and now that I'm a silk, I do it all the time. I, I mean, even when it's very peripheral, because I just feel for a very long time, I didn't see women saying that. I didn't see women saying in court when they were asked to turn up the next day um, at, for an early sitting, when it was obviously going to cause them difficulty. Saw people panicking and sending emails below the table and not saying it. And, and that was something which impacted on women more. And I'm afraid I now say it, because I think it's important when you are further along, rather like you were saying with your scooter and so on, <laughs> um, you've got to show, yeah, you know, yeah. we are different. Yeah. And I think we've got to show that we're different. And that's the only way that we're going to change mindsets. And, and you need the role models. I think you, know, you can't, you can't see, you can't be it. You know, you, you have to, exactly. I mean, maybe not the scooter, but, um, you know, just <laughs> knowing that you can talk about childcare, knowing that that is an issue, that's okay to talk about those sorts of things and for it to be an issue, I think is so important. 
I agree, role modeling is extremely important, both in, at the bar and, and at solicitors and, and, and at the city firms, because I remember as, as a young associate, you know, when I came up to senior associate and, and it was time to, I had those awkward questions as well. Am I going to start family? Am I going to, you know, apply for the for the partnership? Am I, am I going to be on the bench and so on and so forth? Uh, and I remember looking at the fair few women partners they were, especially in corporate finance. And frankly, scarily, the two of them, when I looked at them, I thought, Sorry, but I don't want to be one of them. The role models that I was looking at at the time were essentially women in, you know, cloaked as men, or, or vice versa, if you see what I mean. So they had adapted themselves to be in a male environment, and they were very much like men, or even more ruthless. And I thought, actually, that's not the role model. So I totally agree, and I think that's another thing that's changing, though, in the last couple of decades since we started off, and I think there are mm. more positive role models today where women are embracing being a mom, where they're embracing being a woman, dressing up like a woman, and behaving like a woman, and it's acceptable. Can I, could I just add, um, <laughs> one, one of the things that I think uh, women do a great disservice to other women, women women in positions of seniority, is by pretending it's easy, yeah. or mm -hmm. pretending Absolutely. they haven't had any issues, or yeah. saying they've managed it all by themselves, because honestly, I don't know anybody who's mm -hmm. got caring responsibilities in particular who has managed it alone, in the sense that they haven't got reliable childcare, help from grandparents, or sisters, or friends, or whatever it is, and to pretend that, you're, that you you can do it all on your own. I, I think it just makes other women go, well, I'm just not like her. I can't do that. That's not me. Uh, and you actually disempower mm -hmm. people who you ought to be um, giving a, 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 a book career of hope to. Mm -hmm. But I, one of my uh, senior female partner at Slaughter Remains, sadly now died, but she, the advice that she said the best decision she ever made was the choice of her husband. Mm -hmm. And I would echo that. <laughs> you're, if you I have should have said yeah. husband too, sorry, I messed mm -hmm. him up. But I mean, husband, <laughs> I, you know, my, my husband has uh, basically made my, you know, made my life just amazing. You know, he, he went part time when we had children. He's taken primary responsibility for so much of the involvement with the with running the house and the children that actually I I feel that I'm so grateful for that. And I know that it's it's really hard when I say that to to women in work because they're saying, well, because you can only do this if you've got that. And of course you can you can't only do the job if you have that sort of partner. But you know that that he's the one I'm most grateful for. So big Pippa, vote for Charles. <laughs> I, I realise that we're at risk of only getting to two questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's all right. But it, we're it, covering we're covering a lot of ground here. Yeah. We're giving lots of advice. I, I, just, I just wanted to mention um, imposter syndrome in yeah. connection with this discussion. Yeah. Because it seems to me what Amanda just said about women doing such a disservice to others, and indeed other people who've yeah. made it, pretending that it's easy and not revealing the struggles, then contributes to people below feeling just as you did or just as I did, that why am I here? I mean, in the discussion beforehand with women from both panels, I mean, look at the women on this panel, on the next panel, really incredible women. I heard a large number of people saying, to be honest, I got the invitation, I thought there was some mistake. And <laughs> I, I am afraid if this was an all-male panel, I do not think I would have heard the same conversation. <laughs> yes. And uh, those of you who know my work may be a little surprised at this, but um, there's a quote from Margaret Thatcher, uh, which <laughs> um, uh, the Iron Lady once said, I wasn't lucky, I deserved it. Yeah. And I think when we look around this room, I see many people, and I fully appreciate imposter syndrome is not exclusive to women, but a larger number of women do, all the studies show, tend to suffer it. I see many people here who probably belittle their achievements, say they were lucky, they were in the right place at the right time, and so on. And actually, I, I think we should be a bit more Margaret Thatcher in this way and no other way. <laughs> Very specific. I think that's, I think that's a marvellous point at which maybe to move on to our uh, next question. <laughs> which is an allied question, um, which is, we are a very successful group of women here in the first two rows, and probably, looking around the room, I recognise some of you in the rest of the room too. Um, and we all probably struggle with um, work-life balance or just trying to juggle all the balls, or um, which I feel particularly acutely at the moment as I'm juggling a couple of jobs as well as everything else that's going on um and i'm sure we've all got our own way of trying to prioritize or um cut back or how how do we not kill ourselves by trying to have it all or do it all um 
So I don't know who wants to who wants to start on this. Jessica. Well, it's a really difficult one. I think it's one that most people battle with on a daily basis, honestly, you know, trying to work out if you've got the balance right and sort of seeking that elusive balance. And I think, you know, the reality is that there probably isn't a perfect one. And so the idea of this perfect attainment where your life is somehow in seamless order where... <laughs> Um, you know, you're doing exactly what you should be at work, you're doing exactly what you should be at home, and you're sort of super mum and super um, worker and super every, every other role that you, you have in your life. It's just never going to quite feel like that. And I think accepting that is really important and recognizing um, that there isn't this sort of perfection 100% that if you're not achieving, you are somehow failing yourself and everybody else. Um, and it's a conversation that, you know, I have particularly, I think the one of the, the, the most vulnerable point it, I, I've certainly experienced is sort of coming back from maternity leave, mm. when you face that cruel reality that the world kept moving without you, mm. and that, you know, you were dispensable, effectively, and trying to find your... Um, your voice again and your role again after that, I think is particularly sort of challenging time, especially when you're then at your sort of most juggling of everything. And it can be, it can be really, really tough. But I think that perfection idea is the one that has to be eliminated first and foremost so that you can actually um, recognize, and, and you know, this is when imposter syndrome creeps in it, with a vengeance as well, because it, it, it tells you that you're just not good enough at anything you're doing and you're letting everybody down. And that's, um, you know, that's a real challenge. And in a way, you're your own worst enemy um, and sort of controlling that voice in, inside and not allowing that to get out of control so that actually you do keep some perspective on what's sort of possible and attainable and what you know, the, the contribution you're making is still a really valid one in everything that you're doing and trying to keep keep yourself sort of sane through that, I think is is a really important thing. And then, of course, there's the question of logistics and practicalities, and you've just got to try and sort things in a way that works for you. Mm -hmm. And it will be very different depending on your combination of, um, you know, your your other half, um, your, you know, or your support network around you, what you can use, where you can get the help that you need to let things tick along and, and allow you to feel um, vaguely in control. But I think lawyers are the worst for this because I think lawyers tend to be perfectionists and control freaks. And those two <laughs> things it's a bad are combo, things that will not really give you a work-life balance, actually. Yeah. I think you just need to... I mean, what I always try and do, and uh, I mean, my, I think my partners would say I have far too good a work-life balance because I... I, I actually swim quite seriously, so I, I do quite a lot of swim training, and they still think, how can you do that? And I just think, because I actually every now and then take a step back and think, what do I want to do with my life, and how do I want to chop it up? And that's how it sits, and actually, but you have to give up on the perfectionism, and yeah. I think the trouble is lawyers are perfectionists. Yeah. I agree, you have to be really strict with yourself, you have to give yourself a break. Mm. Uh, and be strategic about the way you use your time. I mean, we're all super busy, and you know, I, I think before kids, you feel you're super busy, and then you have kids, and then you, you know, your brain explodes. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, you have to develop strategies to deal with how you fit what you need to do within the time, and what is really a priority. Um, I mean, for me, actually, this was a piece of advice I received from a, fe a fellow female partner when I returned from maternity leave, which is a ask yourself the life or death question at the weekend. Um, you know, is it life or death that you need to work on the particular piece of, you know, client work, or whatever, you know, now that you've got kids? And if the answer is no, it's not life or death, then don't do it. <laughs> Just don't do it. Yep. You know, you put when you work in asylum law, though. <laughs> <laughs> like, the answer might be slightly different for you. <laughs> I'm glad to say my work doesn't touch That question it. didn't work, because that's the question that um, led to me and... Um, buying an airbag, an air bed in Argos for my chambers because I was tired of making a hamster nest out of barrister gowns, which I was arranging because I couldn't sleep in. Actually, true story. Um, but negative anecdote. I was going to ask Shona next, actually, yes. as to, you know, you, you have that sort of life or death for other people type career. And, you know, it's actually not wrong to want to say, actually, my priorities are this. Now, I mean, that's the other thing is to try and not, I try and not judge other people's choices <laughs> on things like this, whether they choose to have their children brought up by somebody else or whether they choose not to get married or whatever, you know, 
that we have to find our own individual, I think. Uh, but my work answer to work life balance, how to work, is uh, as a person now at the lowest rung of the judiciary, so I'm an immigration judge in Ireland and England, mm -hmm. and looking at a person at the highest rung in the judiciary <laughs> here, um, I, I don't know what your, respectfully, what your work life balance, I'm sure it's not, hasn't been great recently. <laughs> um, <laughs> some weekend working, I think, uh, is necessary, for which we're all very grateful. But. Um, <laughs> Um, but I do very much commend um, the judiciary to anyone. To get, you, you know, they, there's a real <coughs> drive to have more women in decision-making roles. Uh, this is something that I didn't think I'd get. That through I threw my hat in the ring, had very much aspirations for. I was the youngest tribunal member in Ireland when I did so to move away from imposter syndrome, which I feel on this panel, and to say, no, I'm actually brilliant. But um, <laughs> uh, and then, you know, how I overcome that. That just to go back to your question, the uh, the hurdle around. Uh, being female being a disadvantage, you can overcome it with um, merit, like uh, some of the people thought, or you can overcome it with overconfidence, which I have in spades. Lean in <laughs> is the big point to, to, to make on this one. So I, um, having been in my job five minutes in Ireland, deputy chair of my tribunal came up, came up. I applied for that and I came first runner up for that. And undeterred in my, with my lack of success then, when the position of chairperson came up <laughs> six months later, I applied for that. So just lean in. If you're going for jobs that you're not getting, and um, that means you're doing it right. You're aiming high. You're aiming above yourself. When I was at training in the UK for uh, immigration judge, I had there's a whole kind of mixed bags of people. I heard just to echo something that Keelan said. I heard from a woman that when she got offered the job, she thought she was going to ring them up and turn it down because a mistake had been made. She said, "I've only done immigration law for two years, but that was much earlier in my you know 15 year long career, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And then there were men in the room who'd never done a single immigration law case and were like, this is just a stepping stone to being a recorder, but you know, I'm sure I'll be equal to the task. Can't be that difficult, can it? So, um, you know, that's the attitude. Lean in, be overconfident if you want to overcome um, the patriarchy, which is holding us all back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so on the, how do you manage work-life balance? I mean, my answer can be very short, Peppa, which you'll probably like. Badly is my answer. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I think there are things we can do. I mean, on the life and death type question, um, when I was pregnant with my first child, um, at the time, about three quarters of the work that I was doing was emergency out of our judicial review work for um, children. So children who were street homeless, uh, children who were in abusive households and where social services had utterly failed them. So a whole series of these challenges. And at the time, there were very few of us doing that work. So if you got the call asking you to do the emergency duty judge application that evening and you said no and you knew that Ian Wise and Steve Broach couldn't do it, you know, you knew you were leaving that child stuck. And it, it was a really, it, it meant that you did take that on upon yourself. And what you said, Pippa, earlier about in relation to asylum, being able to say, I don't have to do it all. Uh, you did have a real sense that you have to do it all. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just took a strategic decision that actually that work is very important to me. I wanted to continue doing it. It could not be three quarters of my practice mm -hmm. uh, with a young family. So I, I moved things around. I reduced the amount of work that I was doing. Um, we got more junior people in chambers and in other chambers who were interested in that work to start doing it. So then there was a wider pool of people who now do it. And now there aren't only three or four of us who do it. There's actually, unfortunately, rather a lot of us <laughs> uh, who end up having to do it. But you can manage things in that way. And the one other issue that I'd say is a um, large part of the work that I do concerns inquests. Um, and this week, for example, I've just been in New York um, acting um, for a number of journalists who've been harassed for their work, so Maria Ressa in the Philippines, and also for a number of bereaved families um, where their loved ones are journalists and have died simply for doing their jobs. And it has been difficult, obviously, being away from your family. I have gone from Saudi Arabia uh, last week, Riyadh, to uh, New York, and I'm going to Strasbourg on Monday. But something that I think can really drive you doing that kind of work is when you're missing your kids, there is no stronger reminder of how important it is to do a really bloody good job for the bereaved family, mm. uh, you know, who've lost a loved one and who have that feeling in spades. Mm. So I, I think when we think about work-life balance, I never like thinking about the two spheres of life being completely separate because actually there is a synthesis between them. Mm. Um, and uh, I'll end with... Um, uh, a synthesis which I, I thought was quite um, which I thought was quite interesting so my, my daughter who's now 10 nearly 11 
um, has become a bit of a social justice campaigner. Um, so she's Ooh. now... Uh, yeah, sorry. Where did she get that? In, in a whole range of spot in the street. No, I, I do think there's something that you can be quite proud of when you see that. I mean, it did result a few years ago in her school project being the Royal Courts of Justice made from toilet rolls, <laughs> which wasn't one of my proudest moments. But actually, you know, I think it is really important for children, for my kids, uh, one girl, two boys, you know, to see that actually women can be in these roles, women can be doing these important jobs, and that's not necessarily something that I saw in Dublin in the 1970s. Um, and I think that fits with what people were saying earlier about you can't be what you don't see. I, I also think um, when... Pippa actually sent us some of these questions and she said, are there any you don't want to answer? And this was one I said I don't want to answer um, <laughs> for two reasons. One is I don't think there is a thing called life-work balance because for me, work is an incredibly important part of my life and yeah. I really love my job and a bit like you're saying, I'm, I'm always trying my best to do my best for my clients, whoever they may be, and I think what I do is quite important. And I think that's actually a really unusual thing for, that lawyers have that actually not many other areas of life necessarily do. I mean, obviously, doctors and teachers. But there are lots of people in work who don't think their job's very important. And so I think that's a lovely thing for us to have. But so that was part one. I didn't really want to answer it. And the part two was none at all. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I think that you, but you are right, uh, having children who have not necessarily always appreciated the way that I haven't managed to be where they wanted me to be. And I haven't really appreciated it much either. But now, um, I think they are appreciative and um, they do understand, though regrettably none of them want to follow me into being a lawyer. I don't understand why that is. <laughs> um, they do actually appreciate that the woman, just as much as anybody else, can lead an important uh, role in life. Yeah, I mean, if I was going to tell an anecdote from my own life, my eldest daughter, now 28, then nine, when asked, you know, what was she going to do when she grew up? She said, I'm going to be a proper mummy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she hates this story, by the way, so don't repeat it. And, uh, and I said, oh, right, uh, what does a proper mummy do? And she went, well, she's at home when her children come home from school and she bakes cakes. <laughs> mm, right, OK. Um, and... Uh, that that took me back a bit, but I did have this. But actually, uh, I like my job very very much. I think even being a legal academic is quite important. I don't save lives, but maybe I train the next generation to help do important work on the rule of law. And let's not forget how important that is. Um, and now, as an older uh, woman in the workplace, um, she a says, "I never said that." And B, she says, "You would have been foul, Mum." working yeah. and thank goodness you were working because now I can see that, that yeah. it is possible but I agree that you can't get everything right all of the time and sometimes we just have to be good enough whether that's a good enough worker or a good enough parent or a good enough daughter or friend or the other sorts of things that we might be um, juggling and it's not going to be right all or any of the time but I, I absolutely take your point Keelan, about being strategic about things that were important to me. I sort of started asking myself when I kept being asked to do this, that, and the other, is this something that is interesting or important to me? And if not, I learned to say no, mm -hmm. even if necessary, saying it in front of the mirror every morning. So, <laughs> no, thank no. <laughs> not no, sorry, just yeah, yeah. no. Um, so, um, a slightly odd question. Um, but I'll ask it anyway. Do any of our panel think that being a woman has actually been a real advantage in our careers? We were talking about this while we were putting on our makeup, which we don't think <laughs> we were in the loo before coming into this. So that, and I think that's the answer to the question. I think that there's a plus and minus here. I think we all said that, you know, that the impact you can make if you are the only woman in the room, there's a lot of disadvantages about being the only woman in the room, but people may well remember you afterwards. But it's a very negative positive I think that yeah I, I would say no I, I would say in the kind of area of law that I do it doesn't really help at all uh, I've only ever been specifically instructed for someone because they were a woman and I think that's terrible that mm -hmm. that's the way it was kind of organized um, but I I do think there was a different thing going on which may be partly to do with being female which is that when I started, I looked very, very, very young. 
and um, the wig helped actually. It helped to have genuinely helped to have a wig on because that just does slightly change whether you what, what you look like. Hopefully, um, but uh, it did mean people underestimated me. And I don't know whether that's to do with being female, but it definitely was to do with looking very young. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that actually professionally did, did have a positive result quite often. So I wanted to make a similar point. I mean, I think the answer um, for me overall is on balance, it has not been an advantage. And uh, those of you who watched the live stream of the Supreme Court hearing, for example, will have seen um, that every single advocate was male. Yeah. Yeah. And then suddenly on Twitter, people were saying, well, why are all the advocates male? And there was a really pernicious, unpleasant thread which developed, which was well-meaning, um, which was, well, that's because uh, talented women go into family law and immigration. <laughs> so the kind of tone was, there aren't talented women in public law. Now, I am a QC in public law, so I was pretty outraged. But then, of course, if you start wading in, it looks like sour grapes. Yeah. And you see this every year. Those of you who read the directories, for example, yeah. if you look at the directories for both solicitors and barristers in public law, all of the star performers, grade one, grade two, the vast, vast majority of them are men. Yeah. In fact, the only woman in any of the top brackets at the bar is Dinah Rose. Now, mm -hmm. Dinah Rose is wonderful. But she's not the only one. There's a whole range of other very talented women. And it just doesn't occur to people. And in fact, some of the people who spotted the problem in the middle of the hearing uh, were people who it had never registered when they were instructing or when they were making those decisions early. It suddenly just struck them when suddenly online everyone was saying, why have we got this phalanx of white men? But on the uh, underestimation point, um, there was a really good study a few years ago uh, by researchers at the University of Illinois and Arizona State University. And I don't know if many of you know this, uh, they concluded that female named storms have historically killed more people <laughs> uh, because people consider them not to be as risky and then they take fewer precautions. <laughs> so, uh, genuine, it's a brilliant study. So over six decades, uh, the female named hurricanes produced an average of 45 deaths compared to 23 deaths in male uh, named storms. The difference was even more pronounced apparently when comparing strongly masculine names to strongly female names. And the researchers said this, our model suggests that changing a severe hurricane's name from Charlie to Eloise could nearly triple its death toll. <laughs> so the reason I raise that is, I think women are underestimated, even meteorologically. <laughs> there is an advantage when you're underestimated, because actually you go in, people haven't necessarily taken you as seriously as they should have. And I think sometimes that helps. People don't prepare as well. They underestimate how your points are landing. They think you're not having an impact with the judge um, in the same way that, in fact, you are. So I think if they underestimate us using the Illinois-Arizona State University study, we can wreak havoc, and that's an advantage. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else on the panel want to have? Yeah, I mean, the answer, I think, is just no. And if I had a mic, I'd drop it. That was my plan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just to tell a joke I didn't tell. Um, but is it an advantage in my career? No. Is it an, an advantage in my work as a decision maker? Yes, massively yes. So this year in Ireland, a colleague of mine um, turned down a rape-based uh, asylum claim because the woman hadn't gone for counselling. And he said that no one who'd be raped wouldn't go for counselling, and this was relevant to the credibility assessment, and uh, that was refused. And there's a, a different approach that I think I take and women take to claims of gender-based violence which arise in the course of my work. And it's a different type of sensitivity that comes with the fact that I have friends who've disclosed rape to me. You know, the understanding that we as women have of sexual assault moving through the world. So uh, just, yeah, in my work, I can spot gaps. I will go back and look at if there's a late disclosure, what gender the decision maker is. I write it in advance. I did this recently. I said, notice that the claim involves, you know, trafficking and, and, and all this type of thing. I'm wondering if you checked with your client what gender they'd like the decision maker and the uh, uh, solicitor wrote back and said, yeah, we'd ask if you like female gender of court. And I was like, great, we'll get the interpreter, presenting officer, myself, my view, whatever. And then the male solicitor walks in. You know, and it's just not, get, and it, unless you talk to a victim, particularly your close friend or someone like that, and they talk to you about the impact of looking at a female versus the person who's the gender of the perpetrator, the impact of that on you emotionally is so intense and, and just getting that in a way hopefully contributes to me being a better decision maker, I hope. <laughs>
I think that's uh, yeah. a brilliant, brilliant point for the future of the judiciary, and uh, that absolutely everybody needs to be represented in the judiciary. We can't just have uh, particular sectors of society. We can't just have one gender over another um, or one background over another because it's the whole of the experience of the um, panels of judges that make a huge difference. And if I may say so for a moment, that's one of the great things about it being a unanimous decision last <laughs> Tuesday. <laughs> Did anybody else have... Um, is anybody, anybody possibly thinking that it may have been slightly an advantage? Well, I should have said, I, I mean, a lot of my work is on women's rights. And I know my, a lot of my clients uh, do like having a female mm. advocate and a female lawyer. Um, but I still, you know, so lots of my work, I think it, it's an advantage. Um, but overall, on balance, yeah, absolutely not. Mm. Anyone but else? On that empathy point, which you, you've all sort of touched upon, um, and that's obviously extremely relevant to the work that you do because you work with women's rights or, or the judiciary, um, but I think even from sort of private practice or looking at um, the things that you're doing in legal technology or other bits, I think um, arguably is there an advantage to be a woman because majority of these solutions that we are trying to develop and, and the, the sort of approaches that we are trying to uh, apply, design thinking and other things which are very human-centric and which require a lot of empathy, um, well, what very early research, but a project that we are um, collaborating with Oxford University on um, has shown that a lot of uh, people who are leading these initiatives in, in private practice or legal technology companies or others, actually the, the people who are leading tend to be women and, and arguably, is it, is it an advantage? Is it, are we, it, it, does it come easier to us to empathize with the, the sort of human-centric problems and therefore come up with different kinds of solutions, possibly? Okay, well, we're running up against time. So very, very quickly, I wondered if I could ask for a tip from each of our wonderful panel. That what sort of tip would you give to a young woman starting a career in the legal profession today? Now, Keelan said she didn't want to start, and I'm sure it starts with you. Have you Me. got a tip for somebody, a woman starting out in yes. the legal profession? Yes, it's a fantastic career. You should really stick at it, and you should believe that you can get where you want to get to. Um, and it may be, funnily enough, that you don't get to exactly the same destination that you thought you were going to start off from. Mm -hmm. you, need to be a bit, uh, you need to be open to um, different uh, meanders. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you really want something, I think it, my experience has been that it takes longer sometimes than if you're male, but you can definitely get there. Mm -hmm. uh, my tip would be, actually, it's, it's something you mentioned, her, but it's, it's learning the power of no. Um, I think we as women are really good at saying yes. We're often asked to get involved, say, in, in a law firm like mine, in, in a whole host of non-chargeable work, which we therefore can't charge for and therefore we can't be in live promotion as a result of. Um, you know, and, and a lot of really great stuff. But we as women are very good at that stuff. We say yes, we involve ourselves, we throw ourselves in. It doesn't leave us enough time to actually you know, charge the hours, put, put money on the bottom line, be in line for promotion. Um, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but just choose what you do very carefully and very strategically. Do the stuff that really matters like this, you know, that you're really passionate about, or the stuff that's going to raise your profile. So it will have a collateral benefit as well as doing something good. But be strategic about what you take up. Um, that would be my tip. Sarah. Bring yourself to work from the start. I think that's the key bit. You know, there's no point trying to pretend to be something you're not. And actually, um, you will do better from being yourself as well. Mm -hmm. I'll just add to that and build up on that. And I'd say that um, be as ambitious, if not more, than your male colleagues. Do not let anything limit you. Um, it, nothing uh, would limit you more um, And it's, uh, you know, try and think about your career not as a ladder. Try and think about it as a, as a jungle gym. Speaking personally, mm -hmm. when you come across hurdles, you don't have to go on to the next ladder. Is there something else parallelly that you would do which would be equally fulfilling, if not more? Is mm -hmm. there some other way in which you can bring your passion and yourself to the career, to the work and life, and really make the most of your, uh, your, your life as, as a whole? Jessica? Um, I think don't, don't feel that you have to be somebody else in mm -hmm. order to succeed at what you mm -hmm. want to do. And so it's sort of similar to Sarah's yeah. point, really, you know, Channel your genuine self and um, don't think that somehow that's not good enough. Mm. Lovely. Carla? Um, get a mentor. So look ahead of you, kind of 10 years ahead, find someone in a career in a position you want to be in, cold call them out of the blue on LinkedIn and say, 
Do you have time for maybe coffee, love where you are in career, think you're brilliant, whatever. Cold call one of the women on this panel. <laughs> it's enormously flattering. No one is going to say, no, that's terrible. It's an enormously flattering thing to be asked. And then develop a relationship with one or more people to pull yourself up the ladder and then do the reverse. Look down. Have you got a mentor? Even if you're just a student now, you could be helping someone in secondary school, in an access to law program, in an underrepresented group or something like that. We've got intersectionality and women of colour being even more disadvantaged. There's some way that you can also reach out because check your privileges as well. We're all exceptionally privileged yeah. um, to be in this room. So look down and look up the ladder. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I suppose uh, as a human rights lawyer, uh, the job is a very strange one. And on days when you win, when your clients win, it's the best job in the world. So, you know, on the day when the Hillsborough family has got the right result or this week when the Daphne, Daphne Caruana Galizia's family finally got the inquiry that we've been pushing for, or indeed, uh, dare I say it, um, uh, I might be tempting fate here, uh, when uh, the law, it appears, is gradually changing on abortion in Northern Ireland. You know, then they are fantastic days. But the flip side of having wins like that is that on days when you lose, it really matters. And it can be devastating. And you know how devastating it is for your clients. So for that reason, I have on the wall uh, in Chambers a quote from Roald Dahl. I'm going to lower the tone here, uh, yeah. which says, um, I began to realise how important it was to be an enthusiast in life. He taught me that if you're interested in something, no matter what it is, Go at it at full speed ahead. Embrace it with both arms. Hug it. Love it. Above all, become passionate about it. Lukewarm is no good. Hot is no good either. Quite hot and passionate is the only thing to be. <laughs> so my advice would be get a job which you are quite hot and passionate about. Our working lives are long. You have to get something that gets you out of bed in the morning and that keeps you going on those tough days. And it's a total privilege to work with clients like the clients that I have and to be doing a job that I'm quite hot and, hot and passionate about. <laughs> I think that's a that's wonderful great. note to finish. <laughs> and I'd, very, I'd very much like to thank everybody on the panel for your contributions. We have plenty of time at tea to continue our discussions. For those of you who want a little preview of the wonderful book, Judge Brenda and the Supreme Court. <laughs> they are upstairs. There is also a, a flyer for a book by Celia Wells called Women in Law, which is a very interesting um, autobiography about her um, journey through law as well, um, as a legal academic and a woman from a disadvantaged background. Flyers for that upstairs. Uh, and I very much look forward to coming back for the second session at... 2.50. 2.50.